Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, navigating the ancient world with a collection of curious cartographic specimens and other odd bits of history. As always, I am Micah Hanks, and joining me here in the Cross Time Pub are Jason Pentrail, environmental scientist extraordinaire. Good day, Mr. Pentrail. Hey, good morning, everyone. And so, uh, doing things slightly different today, but we're fresh in from the road and we've got a little morning session going on here. That's right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be out there in space time. James Waldo's an hour behind us, having recently relocated to Arkansas. James, are you getting all settled over there? Well, not really. I've been a road warrior for the last couple of weeks, staying in hotels every day. On the weekends, I come back to sort of my hometown, stay with family. I'm actually at my daughter's house. I have an adult daughter. Actually, all my kids are adults. And I'm um, set up on her kitchen table and uh, kind of making this work. I think we can kind of say that your daughter is sponsoring this program by allowing you recording space. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. So uh, thanks to my daughter, Larissa. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, Larissa. We appreciate you giving dear old dad a little space so that he can join us here on the podcast. Yeah, guys, we had a little bit of a break there after our uh, both enlightening and at times controversial discussion with Dr. Bruce Bradley, which I think will probably remain one of my favorites in recent memory uh, and taking a little time off because everybody was busy. Some of us relocating, uh, actually having to do work, <laughs> you know, life ensues from time to time. But, yeah, it's really good to be back behind the microphone with each of you. Jason, how are things going on down there a little further east? Yeah, well, like you said, you know, there's a lot going on. It's a, it's a big time for the family. Um, we're about three months out from having our next son. So he's supposed to be here in early December. So we're gearing up for that and just getting everything ready. And, uh, you know, that kind of throws life into chaos. Sometimes we have a lot of things going on, uh, new opportunities coming up. And we've been trying to get out on the road a little bit and just uh, check things out, find out what's going on out there in the world. And it's uh, it's just one of those busy times in life. The summertime tends to be that way. Yeah, it certainly does. As the resident anomalist, I've been doing everything from booking flights to Portugal, because later this year, as we will hear in the segment that will make up the bulk of this program, I do intend not only to go to Lisbon, Portugal, to hopefully network with some of our friends in the historical and archaeological community there, but also to visit some of the wonderful archaeological museums that are located there. But uh, my good friend Jan and I, who are going over to visit Portugal, we're going to jump on a little flight over to the Azores uh, to visit that area, which I think remains a potential peculiar footnote in antiquity. Uh, I think it's so important to get out there and do what we do as a team as often as we can, whether all together at once or individually. Uh, we get out there into the field, we go to these places, and we do our best to try and chronicle our adventures in the field, not merely keeping our nose in dusty textbooks of olden times. So that's kind of been what I've been up to. And although, Jason, I asked you how things were going down your way, Admittedly, I have seen you quite a bit recently because while we've been taking a brief hiatus from the microphone, you and I were doing some uh, soil research down there in your general locale, spending a lot of time out in hot and humid forest areas around the greater <laughs> Raleigh area uh, with geologists and soil scientists. So that's a lot of fun. And then yesterday, if I may be so bold, uh, you came up to join me for a rather fun and at times frivolous outing because we headed down to Marion, North Carolina for their annual Sasquatch Festival. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, it was just something fun to do. It was something local here in North Carolina, and it was in between you and I. It was just one of those weekends, rarely, that we didn't have too much going on. So we saw it as a good opportunity to hang out and just have some fun and 
you know, got to meet up with some new friends and some old friends uh, as, you know, uh, our longtime buddy Dakota joined us. And it was nice to see him again. We just had a good time out there. Didn't take anything too seriously. But, uh, you know, stopped by the old Sasquatch Brewery there and had a drink and just kind of talked with some folks and laughed and had a good time. Hold on. There's a Sasquatch Brewery? Well, <laughs> so it's not actually named after Sasquatch. Uh, it's actually, if memory serves, isn't it called uh, Micah Town or Micah Mountain Brewing? Yeah, I think it was, yeah, Micah Town, which is, you know, appropriate. Yeah. But for the for the day, you know, everything had a Sasquatch theme. So they had, you know, uh, items for sale and all that good stuff that you would expect at such a such a festival. And um, it was good, man. It was, it was a good beer, good brewery. And uh, it was a lot of fun out there with hanging out with everybody. It was a good time. Yeah, it really was a nice time. Now, I should note a couple of things. The obligatory statements on this subject, if we're going to mention something like the mythical Sasquatch on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, because... This is actually a pretty contentious subject. Now, for me, for my own part, as I think you guys know, I love the cultural motif that is Sasquatch. And I can enjoy that a lot without committing to belief in it, per se. And I acknowledge all the problems with people's interpretation of this as being a literal physical phenomena. And yet... From time to time, I'm compelled by some of the things that we read about that subject. Uh, Archaeologist Myra Shackley, back in the 1980s, had written a wonderful book about this that looked at the possible connections between uh, contemporary reports of sightings of things seen in different parts of the world, although she focused more on the Urals of Russia and the Caucasus. Uh, She looked more at that region of the world, having done her archaeological fieldwork there, but she had said, again, if this is merely a cultural motif, a mythology, an archetype, Those kinds of things don't leave footprints in the ground. And that's an interesting statement, but by the same token, we also have the problems inherent to this. If we have a small population of relict hominoids that exist in parts of the world, perhaps even in parts of North America, no less, how do we account for the fact that there are no bodies found? What do they eat? How do they remain so well hidden? So it's a perplexing issue in that regard, and I'm happy to kind of leave it right there. I would say this, though, that if ever there were anything proven reliably to or even suggestive of in the way of physical proof that helps to define this as more than just a mythology, that would be something that should be inherently of interest to anthropologists. And I think that anthropologists, in terms of how I'm phrasing that, would probably agree. If, that's a big if, but if we ever had enough physical evidence to say, okay, there's something worthy of study here, anthropologists should be interested in that and take it very seriously. But for my own part, and this is, I think, Jason, fundamental to why we went to the event yesterday, for me, it's already of anthropological significance in terms of cultural anthropology, understanding the motif, the interest, the enjoyment people have with Sasquatch. And there's a great podcast that was done by Laura Krantz called Wild Thing, where she kind of looks at this phenomena from that perspective. And again, when we go to an event like that, And you've got the believers. You've got the people who are there just obviously to have a fun time. You've got the people who, like us, are anthropologically minded. And we're kind of going there to have the experience of sharing in an event where there are so many different beliefs, opinions, values, and interpretations present. And we're there just kind of observing, going, see, this is a cultural phenomenon. That alone, to me, is archaeologically significant. First of all, we weren't there on behalf of Seven Ages. We were there as people just going to observe and hang out and just have a good time with friends more than anything. But while we were there from the anthropological viewpoint, we did pick up on a lot of things and it led to some really interesting conversations such as there was quite a significant religious gathering there and, you know, people basically referencing the Bible in in relation to some of these topics and, and different things like that. And then we had people who were just there for the consumerism to buy things for t-shirts and items around the house. But there was a whole section set aside just for, you know, supposed Sasquatch research, um, whatever that means and all the various categories that that falls into. But, you know, so you, you had sort of a research area, you had consumers who were there to just have fun. And then you even had the presence of a religious aspect, which, from an anthropological v- viewpoint, was quite interesting. So what you're saying is it's a great place to go people watch. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, yeah. when I got back in town last night and I stopped at my local pizza joint to grab a pie on the way home, that's exactly what Grace, the bartender, had said as I was recounting to her our adventure out in the field. She'd said, it sounds like a great opportunity to people watch. And I said, yes, I would agree, although 
I don't know how in the world they got people walking around all day in that humid late summer heat in gorilla costumes. I could not imagine why people would want to do that. I don't know. But anyway, hey, whatever floats your boat. And of course, that's why I really enjoy when I see news stories floating my own boat here that have to do with places that we, the team members, have visited in the past. And Meadowcroft Rock Shelter was back in the news recently. TribLive.com reported on the fact that archaeologists are now looking for new clues at the famous Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, Devin Gandy, an archaeologist from St. John's College at the University of Cambridge, and, of course, a gentleman who is a mentor of sorts to us here on the show, James M. Adavazio, the director of archaeology at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Historic Village. These two are teaming up and conducting research at Meadowcroft right now, and what they are hoping to find is possible sediment samples of human DNA from the rock shelter's deepest regions. And the hope is that these sediment samples could give us new information about the first humans who arrived in North America, or at very least those who had a presence at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. Now, a bit of background. The idea of obtaining DNA from the environment is fascinating to me. For instance, there was a recent study that was conducted at the famous Loch Ness in Scotland, where they collected DNA and were able to identify all different kinds of organisms there in Loch Ness. And, of course, as most probably would have expected, there weren't any unidentified organisms, nothing akin to ancient marine life of the paleontological variety found there. But there is an abundance of eels. And so marine scientists are now wondering if indeed some sightings of animals and things in Loch Ness over time couldn't be explained by the presence of some pretty large eels in Loch Ness. DNA is helping us unravel a lot of things about the natural world, but when it comes to human origins, similar studies to this have been conducted at ancient sites in parts of Europe and Eurasia, at Neanderthal habitation sites, where we are now able to extract DNA from cave floors and soil sediments, and that makes it such an exciting time for archaeology. So why not do that in North America as well? And that is precisely what is being undertaken at Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. But this is Significant to us because one of the very earliest outings that we as a team went and undertook was a trip to Meadowcroft. We met Dr. Adavazio, and now Meadowcroft very well may be expanding our knowledge of the ancient past even further. I want to share a quote really quickly from him. He says, what we're hoping that this particular enterprise will do is to add another increment to our knowledge about the site, another piece of information that hitherto we might not have had access to. But again, this environmental DNA is something fairly novel for Meadowcroft. It was a game changer back in 1973 when the first radiocarbon dates coming back from that site indicated that there was a human presence there at least going back to around 16,000 years ago, making it one of the earliest recognized pre-Clovis archaeological sites in North America. Yeah, you know, I think it's really important what they're doing there. Not only that, but because so much of the rock shelter still remains um, unexcavated. So this is one of those sites that with the protections that it has in play with the shelter that's been built around it, it lends itself to future research for students, for scientists and other people. So as we move forward with the advancement of technology and techniques, uh, Meadowcroft Rock Shelter is, is one of those places that we could probably return to again and again over the coming decades. You know, how many other Meadowcrofts are out there and how many, how many of those have their own unique secrets and uh, uh, information to give us about humans past in North America. Well, sure. And we often see sites of potential significance. The thing that just bothers me, though, is when you have ancient sites like Meadowcroft or Monte Verde, which was being excavated right around the same time by Tom Dillahay, beginning in 1973 or thereabouts, you've got actually what may be older settlements adjacent to Monte Verde, the Monte Verde B site that again has radiocarbon dates that seem very reliable that go back in excess of 30,000 years. And yet there seems to be a hesitance by many to acknowledge those. Well, if we just don't talk about it, maybe it'll go away. Eventually, I think many of us are going to look back and we're going to see this as being, again, one of those very important periods in American archaeology where we keep pushing back the timescales on human arrival on the North American and South American continents. It's very exciting. But on the subject of things that can be extracted from the soil and teach us about the ancient past, on the geological front, there is news of a mineral variety, I believe, that will be of significance. And James Walder, why don't you fill us in? Yeah, thanks, Micah. So a new mineral, as you were alluding to, has been discovered. Um, it's called Ed Scottite, 
it, it was discovered in a meteorite found in Australia called the Wedderburn Iron Meteorite because of where it was found contains edscotite and iron carbide mineral never be seen before in nature. Uh, the meteorite was found as a single mass on a road just outside of Wedderburn in Victoria, Australia in 1951. I guess it's probably been in a collection for a while over the years and it, and uh, has made it into somebody's study. Uh, the space rock was uh, well-rounded, and recently researchers with Caltech, the University of California, Los Angeles, and Maine Mineral and Gem Museum teamed up to perform mineralogical investigation of Wedderburn. During an analysis of a polished thick section of the meteorite from UCLA, they identified a new carbide mineral, which they named Edscotite. Edscotite is a new iron carbide joining the other two carbides, found in iron meteorites, coenite and haxenite, as a naturally occurring approved mineral. The mineral name is in honor of Edward R.D. Scott, a pioneering co cosmochemist at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, for his multifaceted contributions to research on meteorites. To characterize its chemical composition, structure, and associated phases, the authors used high-resolution scanning, electron microscopy, electron backscatter diffraction, and electron probe microanalysis. The mineral appears white microscopically in reflected light. Uh, Edscotite precipitates in steels where it is called hog carbide, they noted. The scientists believe the mineral was created in the core of another planet. Like coenite and hexanite, Edscotite forms in low nickel iron, uh, but unlike these two carbides, it forms laths, possibly due to very rapid growth after supersaturation of carbon. James, do you happen to know if this has been formed in a laboratory? Obviously, it's not been seen like this in nature. Yeah, so I doubt we've actually synthesized this as an artificial uh, mineral because we probably didn't think of it. I see. Okay. But in other words, the conditions on Earth are not conducive to the natural formation of this mineral. Well, at the surface anyway. So there may be processes within the interior of the planet that we're not privy to just because we're not privy to those. We can't get there that this stuff might actually form. But as it comes up through the mantle and but, you know, in, in through the crustal processes, it's lost over time. That's really interesting. See, we're always learning new things about our own planet, and sometimes we can learn those things from studying those samples that make their way here from other worlds. Yeah, that, I mean, that's very true. And that's a good reminder that we don't know everything there is to know. Well, that is for sure. And speaking of things to know, we just want to remind everyone that you can find us on all of our social media outlets, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, remember, you can see... Uh, all the videos that we have posted on YouTube, as well as the latest episodes. Uh, James Waldo is going to put those episodes up as soon as they come out on our YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. Also, we do have a donate button. All these research trips and everything that we're involved with does require money, and we do pay for all of this out of pocket. So if you're willing to help us out on that, and it'd be greatly appreciated, you can find that donate button at sevenages.org. And of course, don't forget to rate and review and subscribe to the show on all of your podcast applications, including iTunes and various other Android apps. That's right. These are the things that make the world go round. And so we appreciate all of the input from you guys. And don't forget, if you'd like to reach out to us, send along an email, a note, a news tip. You can email any of us, Jason, James or Micah at sevenages.org. Sevenages.org, of course, is the website, our hub on the web, where you can find all the information about us and our ongoing work and subscribe to the podcasts. And with that, it's about time for us to go to the break. We're going to be delving into an interesting area of archaeological research here. Often you hear, particularly in fringe literature, discussions about out-of-place artifacts and curiosities of history. And a lot of those discoveries really should be taken with a grain of salt. But we're going to look at some of the notable discoveries from over the centuries that have aroused particular interest. And we're going to look at the pros and the cons in favor of some of those. Is there more to history than we actually know? And particularly, can we find evidence of those sorts of things and curious coins and cartographic enigmas that turn up from time to time? We'll explore all of that and more when we return here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal.
The Seven Ages team and I, we spend so much time in so many fascinating places, uh, including South Carolina, where archaeology and the study of the ancient human past is so rich that sometimes I feel like up here in the Appalachian Mountains where I am, it's almost barren. In other words, I don't hear as much of unique archaeological interest as I do further to the east and, of course, further south down into South Carolina and around the coastal regions. But from time to time, you do find interesting things in the great old North State. And I want to reference a very interesting entry that was included by the late William R. Corliss in one of his archaeological source books. And this has to do with, yet again, very appropriately, mica mines that were found here in North Carolina in 1875 near Geyer. And one of the pits yielded some rather surprising artifacts. Now, this particular pit was different from the usual crude surface excavations. Some digging at this particular location proved that there was actually a shaft about 50 feet deep. And at the 40-foot level, a short adit, that is a horizontal tunnel, was discovered. And it was while clearing this adit, this kind of almost think of that as an addition to the existing tunnel structure, They were clearing that shaft, and the workers discovered several iron implements at that low level in this apparent mica mine, including an obvious axe head. Well, prehistoric American Indians normally had access to only small bits of meteoritic iron. Now, why this is significant, of course, is because at the time, in the 1880s, when this discovery was made and it was written about, some interpreted this as being evidence of Europeans that had actually been involved in the construction of this site. But it may not go as far back as those who found the apparent mica mine at the time had supposed. In fact, as we now know, DeSoto's expedition made it very close to this area, and some have supposed that the evidence of the mining operation may simply have shown that the Spanish, whether from DeSoto's expedition or in another instance, had been there. But it's nonetheless rather interesting. And another report of iron artifacts from around that same time, this one dated to 1884, had actually been a Native American burial pit that was rather oddly shaped in a triangular formation. I want to give an account of this from 1884. They say on the northwest side of this triangle formation, 10 or more bodies were found, which appeared to have been buried at one time. Now, they said that what may have been an actual leader of a nearby encampment with his head facing northeast, face down, was found within this mound. Under his head, they said, was a larger seashell with what appeared to be markings on that. And around his neck were large-sized beads, but at or near each ear were the larger pieces of copper that were extracted from this excavation. There was also a piece of copper under his breast. His arms were extended, his hands rested about one foot from each side of his head. Around each wrist was a bracelet composed of long cylindrical copper beads and shell beads alternated. At his right hand were found the implements of iron. And so they say under his left hand was a small seashell, also with writing on the concave surfaces. Corliss adds that the underlining in the original report, having to do with the discovery of iron in this burial site, uh, reflects the startling nature of the presence of iron artifacts when intrusive burial could be ruled out in this instance. Of course, I should further note that on the shells, what they refer to in the original report from 1884 as hieroglyphics actually detailed serpent-like imagery. And this is particularly interesting because although we have the great winged serpent that's prevalent in the Mississippian culture, many interpreted some of the imagery in this burial mound as being similar to that of the iconography of Mesoamerica, which actually is more common, I think, than many people realize. During a discussion we had with Dr. Robert Carballo of Boston University some time ago, he had noted the fact that obsidian, which had apparently come from Mesoamerica, was also excavated from the Spyro Mound in Oklahoma, To me, that's not all that unusual. Again, if we look at the presence of cocoa at Chaco Canyon and what we just noted that Dr. Carballo pointed out during his appearance on the program, uh, the exchanges between these different cultures is not all that unusual to me. I think maybe that the discussion of the iron tools in the mica mine should be taken yet again with a grain of salt because at the time of the discovery, naturally people look at this and they say that there is a much earlier arrival by Europeans in North America. In fact, the provenance of those iron implements may be much more recent, but nonetheless, they're one of those curious little footnotes in history that gets us thinking. I'm far more interested in the fact that there had been what appeared to be iron in the burial mound referenced, which had not been an intrusive burial. That's interesting. And you know, mounds in general are very curious things. Uh, Unfortunately, as we all know, with the advent of agriculture, we've lost 
untold amounts, thousands and probably thousands of mounds that have been completely destroyed over the years. But for the ones that have been excavated properly and given their due diligence through the practice of archaeology and anthropology over the years, we have gathered invaluable amounts of, of information. And, and oftentimes, whether it's a Mississippian mound, whether it's an Adena mound, a Hopewell mound, and a Copina mound, there's all sorts of different representations. And each one kind of has its own characteristics. Even within individual cultures, sometimes you'll see some variances and differences. But each one that's been excavated professionally has always given uh, just massive amounts of information. And that leads to our next topic, which is the Grave Creek Stone. Now, again, we had the opportunity to travel on our now uh, well-known epic Ohio archaeological trip a couple of years back. And, uh, you know, I can speak for the group when I say that it was certainly one of our favorite trips. We, we gained so much knowledge when we were up in Ohio and West Virginia, and certainly something we're looking forward to doing again. But one of those sort of odd and unusual artifacts that came to light was known as the Grave Creek Stone. Now, the Grave Creek Stone was discovered back in 1838 during an excavation at the Grave Creek Mound. Grave Creek Mound is located in Moundsville, West Virginia, right there on the Ohio River. Uh, the stone itself is a small inscribed sandstone disc. So we're looking at about 4.8 centimeters wide by 3.6 centimeters high. So very small item, um, and it's only inscribed on one side. Uh, nobody really knows where the actual Grave Creek Stone is located today, the original one. However, there are uh, copies of it that that were made in, in castings and waxings and things like that from from the original stone. So in 1868, we do know that the stone was in the collection of E.H. Davis, who we know from Squire and Davis fame. They were the ones that were documenting and, and doing those uh, drawings of all the various sites throughout Ohio Valley and, and different uh, sites throughout the Southeast. And they, they are, you know, gained a lot of fame from these drawings that they did. But E.H. Davis of that well-known duo was the original uh, proprietor of that Grave Creek stone. Um, eventually that was sold off to the Blackmore Museum and now supposedly is part of the British Museum. So keeping that in mind, this small lozenge shaped stone has quite a history to it. So when we get into the controversy of it, uh, as these things always tend to do, we have to back up and, and look at the time period in which it was found and how it was found. So the markings themselves, they're variously read as Celtic, Norse, or possibly Phoenician, which you know in itself is quite interesting. Um, the stone appeared to confirm the popular idea at that time of old world cultures that were building the mounds in North America. So if you're not familiar with this at this particular time, as these mounds were being discovered, as agriculture was expanding and many of these mounds were being excavated, they were being found on people's property who are going in, digging into the mounds and removing these items. It was the thought of the time that they were not made by Native Americans because of the, the structures themselves of them being sort of looked at as an advanced technology. It was thought at the time that the Native Americans weren't capable of building such things. Therefore, many of these ideas came about during that time period that uh, obviously have been refuted since then. And the, the Native American cultures have been given the, the due diligence um, that they deserve for being the the builders of the mounds. Getting back to the Grave Creek Stone, however, in 2008, at the annual meeting of West Virginia Archaeological Society, uh, anthropologist David Osreicher offered evidence to suggest that the Grave Creek Stone can easily be dismissed as a fraud. So Osreicher found that the source of the stone's confusing mixture of alphabetic signatures. So if you look at this Grave Creek Stone, you know, pull it up online and take a look at it. it it's sort of a jumble of uh, ancient lettering. It doesn't really seem to make a whole lot of sense. In fact, if you head over to sevenages.org, we will include a photograph of a replica that we actually took ourselves at the Grave Creek Mound Museum, uh, along with the show notes for this episode. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we did get to see this replica in, in real life and, and photograph it. So yeah, please take a moment to look at that. Now, Oshreister found that the source for the stone's confusing mixture of ancient alphabets was uh, present in a 18th century book that was available at the time on unknown letters that are found in most ancient coins and monuments of Spain. So according to him, everything on the stone, including this impossible sequence of characters, they all have the same mistakes 
that are listed in this book. Uh, he also thinks that the perpetrator of this fraud was a local Wheeling physician. Wheeling is a, a nearby town. Uh, James W. Clemens, who had borrowed a large sum of money to bankroll excavations in that area and was apparently disappointed when nothing significant was found. So it was, you know, basically his thoughts that the creation of this stone was, as we talked about, uh, oftentimes there's these strange little artifacts that pop up that will draw attention that will allow for admission and people will pay that price to come in and see something very unusual. And that seemed to be the case surrounding this Grave Creek stone. So looking back at this story, we see that planting this sensational artifact, it provided you know, him an opportunity to try to recoup some of those losses for that money that he had borrowed. But uh, many scholars ridiculed the stone as a forgery, and eventually his dreams of fortune ended in financial ruins, which you know some people would say that's appropriate for uh, taking part in that sort of thing. So as we can you know, pretty soundly dismissed the Grave Creek Stone as, you know, the lettering doesn't seem to make any sense. Something that is much more interesting is the presence of what are known as the Adena tablets. Now, one of these tablets, there tends to be about 13 of them right now that are recognized as being authentic. Uh, the Cincinnati tablet, let's talk about that one for a minute. So this was discovered in 1841, Cincinnati, Ohio. This occurred when a grading team was removing a complex a human-made burial mound, and this was located near 5th and Mound Streets, um, which happens to be today a uh, UPS facility uh, just west of the Interstate 75 there. But while removing this mound complex in preparation for putting a road through that area, uh, workers began to, uh, to find these beautiful and exotic artifacts. Uh, we saw uh, copper cutouts, um, lithic tools, galena ore. Again, mica was found there, just like we just okay. discussed. Yeah. Um, shell, bone, copper beads, uh, bear teeth that were perforated for, for pendants and jewelry, uh, large marine shells, you know, uh, just a, a plentiful array of artifacts. And, and this was very well established as, as being Adena in origin. Uh, but within that, the discovery of the Cincinnati tablet um, was found in that array of artifacts. And it, of course, drew a lot of attention right away because it was so unusual uh, compared to the other artifacts that were being found. Uh, that name, Adena tablet, quickly became kind of just a, a general term for what you called these things. But these type of tablets, if you want to envision them, they, they refer to a, a really rare type of artif artifact that's been recovered. Um, it's, it's associated primarily with the Adena culture, and it's from the early, early woodland period. So we know that there's 13 of them out there today that we know of that aren't in private collections or, or that haven't been found and never, you know, uh, been accounted for. But we know that there's at least 13 found in uh, Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia. Now, the tablets themselves, if you're using your imagination here, they're engraved in deep bash relief. So these are very deep engravings on these tablets. They're uh, generally made of like a fine grained sandstone although a few of the tablets have been found um, made out of limestone, shale, and even clay in one, one particular case. These uh, tablets, they're engraved on one, sometimes both sides. They have zoomorphs, so animal shapes. They have uh, curvilinear geometric designs. They are uh, interpreted often as raptorial birds. Sometimes they're thought of as human shaman motifs, something along those lines. But often they have uh, stylized geometric designs and they have, most of the time, bilateral symmetry. So that seems to be important to whoever was making these tablets, that they, they had that symmetry on both sides, which is, is something that we see throughout a lot of the art of uh, Central, South, and North American Native cultures. Now, what's really interesting is these tablets, you know, fairly small size, we're not sure exactly what they were used for. However, a few of them have been found with red ochre residue. Uh, red ochre, of course, is a... A natural substance that was used for dyeing, that was used for uh, funeral rites, that's often found on artifacts from uh, funerary mounds. I believe it was even found on the famous Anzic I burial of the Clovis child um, that we've often referred to on the show. Um, ho however, in addition to that, on a stylized surface of these tablets, um, you can often find those little pieces and stain of that red ochre. Now, what were they used for? You know, of course, that always is the question when we find an unusual artifact. Several of these have uh, basically grooved out 
areas on the back that look like they could have been used for sharpening of awls or bone needles, bone pins, something along those lines. So it's thought that due to the presence of both the sharpening on the back of the tablet itself and the presence of a stain or a, a colored mineral that they very well could have been used for stamping fabric. They could have been used for stamping basketry, or they could have possibly been used for a tattoo template. So again, we've covered tattooing, ancient tattooing on the show before with Aaron Dieter Wolf. We know how important tattooing seems to have been to most, if not all native cultures. So these, these very unusual tablets do exist. Like again, there's 13 of them out there. Each one has its own uh, artistic styling and several of them do have these deep grooves on the opposite side that seem to indicate that it was used for sharpening some sort of implement, possibly for human tattooing. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I think, you know, it's worth noting here that we, when we find unusual things in mounds, particularly during excavations of mound sites, it should be noted that there are a variety of ways that things can appear inside of a mound. Uh, one of those would be that at the time of the construction of the mound or during one phase of construction, because some of the mounds, again, stratigraphically are indicative of being mound structures that were built onto progressively over time. It could be that during one building phase, an item actually was placed within the mound. There is some evidence that much later items have been inserted, perhaps for ceremonial reasons, within mounds, and therefore they may appear out of place, but in truth there is a well-understood mechanism for how they could find their way within a mound. But these are objects that were not contemporaneous with the actual structure and its building phases. And then finally, yes, there is the unfortunate presence of hoaxes. It seems likely that the Grave Creek tablet was likely best described as something that was a hoax because of the appearance of the glyphs, the apparent means by which they were produced and might have been inserted into the mound, and also the motivation for doing that. And this is, again, something that's fundamental to understanding some of the alleged anomalous archaeology of this period. And we are going to come back around to one of the more enigmatic instances of alleged language on a tablet from another part of the world here in a moment. But I want to offer here, while we're discussing North American mound excavations, you know, the curiosity of the so-called elephant effigy pipes. There are a lot of different attitudes about what something like that could represent. Because on the one hand, if indeed these are valid, genuine artifacts from pre-Columbian times, the question is, how would Native Americans have known of elephants? Do these detail references to extinct megafaunal species like mammoth and mastodon in the Americas? Do these account for possible diffusion, the idea of exchanges of knowledge, art, and other things between different cultures from different parts of the world? This is one primary reason why many scholars today look at the idea of an elephant represented on an effigy pipe as being more likely to have been a hoax because what it seems to infer is that, well, these ancient people, whoever built these mounds, had knowledge of other parts of the world. And this would have at very least been an acceptable position by those early diffusionists who were trying to argue against the fact at that time that the mounds, the mound building cultures, more importantly, had actually been Native Americans. And this was a, a great big fight that really broke out between some of the early antiquarian groups, such as the Davenport Society and the newly formed Smithsonian Institute. And so when you look at this historically... Some of the controversies associated with these artifacts, they aren't merely a modern situation where we have scholars trying to preserve the actual history of the Americas. Many of these debates have actually been raging for more than a century. And while I would hold out that it's possible that some of these unusual artifacts may simply be evidence of a broader knowledge and awareness by Native American cultures than we would generally be able to prove by modern standards, we have to be very cautious when we interpret these things as such. We need to kind of look at the, the story, look at the backstory, look at the individuals involved with the discoveries, and look for the possibility that there are ulterior motives. And if those can't be ruled out, those are, I think, the primary circumstances where we really have to proceed with caution when we try to assess the meaning behind these so-called anomalies in archaeology. I want to kind of shift our attention over to the Rongo Rongo tablets from Easter Island, because these are tablets which may show writing. Some interpret them as being such. I want to reference a monograph from 1891 that was titled Te Pito Te Henua, or Easter Island by William J. Thompson, where he discusses the discovery of these tablets, their acquisition, and then the impossible interpretation of them as being language. 
And for those who would say, well, if they aren't language, that, that seems to be obviously what they are. What else could they be? Jason, just like you mentioned about some of the tablets from North America possibly being tattoo stamps or being guides or something for that purpose, the same interpretation has been applied to some of the Rongo Rongo tablets from Easter Island as well. And again, where we can see the use of an artifact for one purpose in another part of the world, that does help us sometimes discern what something similar might have been used for in another part of the world. That's not always the case. But in 1891, Thompson had discussed how a elder on Easter Island, and this actually took place in 1886 when he went to the location, Uri Vayakeo was one of the elders who claimed that he was fluent in interpretation of the tablet. And they asked Vayakeo to interpret these tablets for them, which requires, in order to read them in the way that the glyphs appear on the tablet, it must be turned in order to do so. And so he appears to be turning and actually reading and this is the account that Ure Vayakeo gives from one of the primary Rongo Rongo tablets. He says, Moho Uakuta, the chief of a powerful clan, when about to make war to revenge the death of one of his relatives, who had been killed by treachery, summoned Timo, the builder of foul houses, and ordered him to construct on the windward side of the house of Teho, the fisherman, a foul house of 100 crescent-shaped stakes. It was ordered that of the fowls captured in the war, those with long tail feathers and the white ones should be reserved and sent to this house for safekeeping. The warriors of the clan assembled promptly at the council fire with their faces brilliantly painted and wearing their distinctive shell necklaces. The solemn ceremonies attendant upon the declaration of war were performed by the assembled braves in accordance with the ancient customs handed down by their forefathers. Obeisance was first made to the sky, each warrior repeating the prayer— May we be killed in battle if we neglect to worship the great spirit. The ceremonies concluded with obeisance to the god of feathers, each warrior wearing the feather hat of his clan, Aranuku, the god of feathers, whose costume consisted of feathers for the head, feathers for the neck, and feathers to be waved by the wind. He who brings good luck when feathers are worn that are tied by a string of hair, he who protects the yams and potato plantations when feathers are tied upon a stick and placed those together between the hills, he who keeps off the evil spirit when feathers are planted over the burial places. Now, the tablet goes on to give this account of war and battle, and it also goes on to tell of a beautiful queen. And this is kind of interesting. I found this account fascinating. They write, Where is our ancient queen? It is known that she transformed into a fish that was finally caught in the still waters, a fish that had to be tied by the rope of Haros to be captured. Away, away, if you cannot name the fish, that lovely fish with the short gills that was brought for food to our great king, and was laid upon a dish that rocked this way and that, the same that afterwards formed the corner of the stone wall that led to the house of the great chief." So these were some of the rather interesting accounts that were given by Ure Vayakeo in his reading of this Rongo Rongo tablet. But there is some question over whether or not it was actually being read by the elder. And I want to refer to Thompson's own notes from his 1891 monograph here, where he says, Ure's fluent interpretation of the tablet was not interrupted, though it became evident that he was not actually reading the characters. It was noticed that the shifting of position, remember, the turning of the tablet that's required in order to be able to read in the appearance of the glyphs and their orientation. He says, It was noticed that the shifting of position did not accord with the number of symbols on the lines, and afterwards when the photograph of another tablet was substituted, the same story was continued without the change being discovered. The old fellow was quite disposed when charged with fraud at the close of an all-night session, and at first maintained that the characters were all understood, but he could not give the signification of hieroglyphics copied indiscriminately from tablets already marked. In other words, if they took them out of the order that they appear on the Rongo Rongo tablets and placed them individually, he couldn't say this one means this and this one means that. And so he explained at great length that the actual value and significance of the symbols had been forgotten, but the tablets were recognized by unmistakable features and the interpretation of them was beyond question. Just as a person might recognize a book in a foreign language and be perfectly sure of the contents without being able to actually read it. And so with little doubt, the interpretation seems to be that Ure was speaking of a culture, a tradition, and perhaps this being passed down by different traditions there on Easter Island, passed down orally, and over time people are taught these traditions, they almost remember them word by word. He said that what is represented there is language, but the specific glyphs aren't, aren't capable of being read any longer. And to this day, the tablets from Easter Island remain undeciphered, despite the fact that we have this ethnological writing, which gives us a good idea of what the story they entail 
may actually be. Some have supposed similar things about Mayan glyphs, that they may actually serve to trigger the memory of oral traditions more than they are in actual literal written language themselves. But when you look at many of the glyphs, it almost becomes difficult to see them as something apart from being language. And the fact that there are so many ancient languages, or at the very least, there are glyphs that may represent languages that remain undeciphered, that is truly fascinating to me. And there are a lot more of them probably than is uh, often discussed on podcasts like this. Well, Rango Rango has always been one of those great mysteries. And, you know, you have to ask the question, if it's not relaying a language, then what is it for? What is it meant to do other than that? You know, what is the purpose of it? And so, you know, we think back to hieroglyphics that were eventually uh, deciphered through the Rosetta Stone. Uh, many of those same questions surrounded those prior to that, that interpretation of finding that Rosetta Stone um, and, and being able to finally at long last get some insight to what was being relayed there. So, you know, Easter Island as a whole, uh, the Rango Rango has always been uh, just a paramount mystery. That whole whole island, that whole region being so far from any other civilization, uh, but yet having a long-term uh, occupation there has always been something of great interest to me. Absolutely. I have to tell you what else is of interest to me, guys. I have been fascinated for some time now with the Azores. And the Azores, of course, are a small grouping of islands that are found out there in the middle of the Atlantic. They're Portuguese territory. And what's kind of interesting about them is that they're almost undeniably connected to the mythology of Atlantis. And by that, I mean the fact that, again, uh, Ignatius Donnelly wrote about his theory that the Azores might be the mountain peaks of what was once the submerged continent of Atlantis. And James, it might be interesting to get your perspective on this because Certainly at the time of the end of the Pleistocene, when sea levels were lower, more of the Azores would have been exposed. However, it's not my contention that those are literally the Atlantis referred to. My whole take on Atlantis, as you guys know, and perhaps we should do a, an episode all about this at some point. But the argument that I make is that Plato was not a historian. He was a philosopher and he made analogies. You know, he gave examples in his dialogues. The idea that he would do anything differently in Timaeus and Critias... And he would suddenly begin to impart a history about a fabled lost continent from 9,000 years ago. Seems very strange in the context of all of the broader writings that Plato gave us. And I had a another, I guess you might say someone who's more of the mind that Atlantis actually existed, trying to debate this with me. And they said, well, why would he lie? Plato never lied about anything else. Why would he just suddenly lie about Atlantis? Sooner or later, we're going to find Atlantis, Micah. You'll be proven wrong. And I said, no, no, I'm not saying Plato was lying. I'm saying that in all of the other writings, he gives dialogues, and these are often examples where a story is told or an example is given to illustrate a broader truth, and that is the consensus opinion among scholars as to the origin of the Atlantis story. Most of Plato's students took it as being the same thing. That should be remembered. There were a few who came along in later generations who also wondered, however, you know, within a few decades after Plato's passing— there were at least a few who had begun to say, well, what if Plato was actually writing history here? And again, putting Atlantis aside, because of the debate over it, now you know my personal feelings about it, the debate over Atlantis has continued to rage on for centuries. It's kind of fascinating. But because of that, many people have said, well, let's see if we can find evidence of anything that would account for these legends. And interestingly, the Azores out there in the middle of the Atlantic uh, have drawn attention in that regard for me, I don't know that we can say that that's proof of Atlantis. I, I find that to be quite a stretch, but I'm fascinated nonetheless with the Azores because there is some evidence, as we're about to see, that is suggestive of the idea that the Azores may have been discovered and visited well in advance of the Portuguese and their official discovery of the islands we know today as the Azores. But, you know, James, again, I did want to kind of talk to you about the idea that during the Pleistocene, more of that land mass might have been exposed and that this is not necessarily a crazy idea that it, at various times the Azores might have been discoverable by maritime groups. Yes, but let me back up because I've got an interesting tie into the Azores here, which, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting place. But a uh, uh, guy that used to be my boss spent quite a bit of time at the Azores several years ago because he was working on a project for the Air Force. So I got to hear all about the Azores and the culture there. And, and it's all very interesting. But as far as the, you know, uh, the Azores maybe being a prime candidate for Atlantis, um, you know, maybe. So during the, the Pleistocene, the last glacial maximum, we know that sea level was about 400 foot lower 
uh, you know, globally than it, than it is now. And I went and looked at and, and tried to get some, some, uh, elevations and just get some kind of a graphical look at what we know about the submerged, uh, portions of the islands of the Azores. And, what I didn't see and what I had hoped to see is maybe some areas that look like prime candidates for habitation, like mm-hmm. flat areas that would be would have been above sea level uh, at that time. And I didn't really find anything uh-huh. uh, to my uh, disappointment. Now, I'm not saying that that's a, an exhaustive research effort and it rules everything out. It doesn't. But I just didn't see anything that jumped out at me at the time. Right. And again, I think the case for the fact that there are islands out there being therefore Atlantis. That's kind of a leap of judgment, and although that's an idea, it's by no means a new one. It's one, as I mentioned, that had been proposed uh, toward the end of last century uh, by uh, Ignatius Donnelly in his famous, many view it as authoritative book on Atlantis. He had looked at the Azores as being the possible location of the, the lost continent. Again, did this island continent actually sink into the ocean, or did sea levels rise and it's uh, submerged in that fashion? I mean, it is interesting, but... To me, I don't see any direct evidence of it actually being Atlantis. What nonetheless drew me to the Azores, though, had been the fact that uh, we'd had a conversation with Randall Carlson where he had said, well, if you think about the fact that uh, the mid-Atlantic ridge was under extreme pressure by the ice sheets at the end of the Pleistocene, this could have possibly caused even more uh, of a prominence than merely the uncovered landmass with the lower sea levels. He would said, geologically speaking, there's some factors that should be looked at there. Now, the geology is interesting. Then I said to myself, I'd like to look at the archaeology. What the archaeology seems to suggest, again, there's only scant references, but nonetheless, they are interesting, and they are indicative of the possibility of Carthaginian coins and the like being found on those islands, which doesn't go all the way back. You know, that's certainly not far enough back for the idea of Plato's Atlantis. It is nonetheless interesting in the context of there being maritime cultures having been to the Azores before the Portuguese discovery of the islands, officially in 1427. Now, there was an article that appeared way back in 1990 in Archaeology magazine titled Timelines of Phoenician Fable, and Patricia and Pierre Bicay wrote a rather interesting article that looked at this possibility, the anecdotal accounts of Carthaginian coins being found on the Azores and trying to make, well, no pun intended here, but heads or tails of that, And here is what they had to say, that on the island of Corvo in the Azores, a 10-square-mile speck of land, it's the focus of a most remarkable story of ancient seafaring, a tale involving a statue and a hoard of Carthaginian coins. In the year 1567, when Damien de Goes, biographer of the 16th century Portuguese kings, reported that a stone statue of a bare-headed man clothed in a Moorish cape and seated on a horse had been found at Corvo. His left arm rested on the horse's mane while his right arm stretched straight out with the index finger pointing to the west. King Emmanuel of Portugal sent for the statue, but those in charge of the project carelessly broke it, according to the story. Nonetheless, the heads of the man and the horse and the right arm of the pointed finger are said to have been brought to the king's palace for display. Now, in 1628, Manuel de Faria y Sousa, another Portuguese historian, repeated de Gosa's tale. And they note it might as well have died there, but in 1778, Johann Paudelin, a Swede born in Portugal, published a remarkable story. And here is what he said. He claimed that in 1761, he went to Madrid to see Friar Henrique Flores, a professor of theology and also, incidentally, a numismatist. He was a coin collector, in other words. And he had given him two gold and five bronze coins from Carthage and two bronze coins from Cyrene in North Africa. These were dated to about 200 B.C., He claimed, however, that these coins were the remnants of a hoard found in November 1749 in a black pot near the foundation of a destroyed building in Corvo. In other words, one of these small islands out there on the Azores. Now, that's really interesting, if that's true. Now, at this point, I should really emphasize the fact that we have to kind of understand what the Greeks particularly, what the maritime cultures at that time believed, what their reasons for placing objects on lands or islands that they may have sailed to would have been, some of the implications historically for things like this. And Pierre and Patricia Bicall in their article from 1990 delve into this a bit. They wrote, In order to guarantee a trade monopoly against the Greeks in particular, the Phoenicians promulgated the myth that the Atlantic was a muddy, impassable sea infested with monsters. 
And the idea of it being muddy and impassable yet again kind of nods to Plato talking about a sunken continent. It's funny that for 9,000 years if a continent had sunken that the waters would remain muddy after that. <laughs> so the Phoenicians kind of continue with this, this mythology. They didn't believe this myth themselves. They had colonies up and down the Atlantic seaboard and they had circumnavigated Africa by the 5th century B.C., the Phoenicians and Carthaginians were secretive about their routes, and it served that secrecy to let the world know that ships could not sail beyond the Strait of Gibraltar. Plato and Aristotle were among those who accepted the myth as fact. So you can infer a little from that, of course. But they said that the myth of the warning statues found its way from Arab geographers to medieval European cartographers, and as far back as 1367 made its clearest appearance on a map created by the Italian Pizzigano brothers. And at the edge of their map that they created... Just about where the Azores actually would be, there's a figure with an outstretched arm and next to it a medallion with an inscription on it. And the inscription is in part unintelligible, they say, but the message still seems to be pretty clear. There's a warning. The statue's there, and it's indicating that navigation beyond that statue is impossible. The Pizzaganos probably placed their warning in the area of the Azores by accident, and this is the interpretation of the Bikais in their article. But they said that the chance gave rise to the notion that the statue was in the Azores when the islands were discovered a few years later. Now, it's kind of weird, by the way, in the article that they mention the Pizzigano map being made in 1367 and then the Azores being discovered a few years later. I'm sorry, we're talking about the passage of time from 1367 to 1427, so it's at very least a few decades. I don't know, it's a little weird to write. A few years later, they find the Azores. But in, again, the idea is maybe that knowledge of the Azores had predated the official discovery in 1427, so maybe it's actually not that far off to say that they were discovered a few years later. They note that it's likely that a natural rock formation on the north side of Corvo, called Ponta do Marco, the boundary marker, came to have its name because early sailors identified it as the actual location of the statue. When the edge of the world, as they called it, disappeared with the discoveries made by Columbus, the statue at that point no longer had any new unknown land to move further beyond and to. But I should point out, by the way, that on his way back from the discovery of the new world, Columbus actually did stop over at, you guessed it, Corvo. So he'd actually been there. And that's something that they point out that Columbus and his men stopped there and there was no archaeological evidence, no historical reference, you know, any anything that they left behind that shows us that they were there, but we know from Columbus's own account that they actually stopped on Corvo. But in conclusion, they write, they ask, again, if de Goas's statue is not evidence of early voyages, what about the Podolin coins? Today, it is impossible to say whether they were actually found on Corvo. If it was a hoax, what was the motive? To ascertain a motive, we need to know more than we ever will probably about Podolin and Flores. Was it a simple error on their part? Is it possible that the coins were indeed from a place called Corvo, not from the island, but from the town of the name located in the tin-bearing region of the Portuguese mainland, which also has that name? A town they note here, by the way, that may have attracted the Carthaginians as it was within easy reach of their other settlements. It is likely that the answer to the question of Corvo has less to do with archaeological proof, like new surveys of Corvo, than with close attention to the nature of the myth. We believe that the story of the statue was just a chance conjunction of an old Phoenician legend, the end of the age of exploration and natural phenomena, i.e. that geological formation that some people actually saw as being the statue out there on Corvo. Further, the statue and the coins are probably not two separate stories, but part of one process in which the coins were attached to the myth of the statue by Podolin. And the authors note that as they're leaving Corvo, because they visited the Azores for this article, uh, they got on a speedboat and had someone drive them out there, or, or boat them out there, to the island. I hope to do that when I visit the Azores, by the way. <laughs> I doubt I'll find Carthaginian coins, but I'd love to get out there and at least see the uh, location where this mythology is attached. But nonetheless, they say, as we left Corvo, we were persuaded that stories of Carthaginian visits were probably nonsense. That's what the locals told them. But they ask again, is the statue of Ponta do Marco evidence of a Carthaginian voyage? Highly unlikely. Are the coins evidence? It is now impossible to say. Yet explaining away the statue and the coins begs the question, could the Carthaginians have reached Corvo or the Americas? Now, most scholars reject that idea, but by the 8th century BC at the latest, Phoenician ships were regularly going from Tyre and Sidon to the trading stations at Mogador, a distance of more than 2,000 miles. Sailors who did that were located just where the Canary Currents start to head west, just where the Columbus route to the Americas leaves the African coast. And so they say, 
If the Azores were found in antiquity, shouldn't there be evidence of the fact there? Yet again, not necessarily. And they actually state there was no native population with which to trade, and stops for water like the one Columbus made would likely have left no trace. Those two factors indicate that maybe there wouldn't have been anything left behind. And they conclude saying that the Atlantic was not a muddy, impassable sea infested with monsters before 1492. Scholars who reject even the possibility of Atlantic voyages in antiquity seem to believe the Phoenician myth that it was. And that's a great way to end that, because maybe they did make it out there, and there's that old adage that absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. And such may be the case also with Corvo. And there are many other instances where coins have allegedly turned up in various locations. I'll just give brief mention of a few of these here because there's a lot to cover. But again, there are the alleged discoveries of Roman Antoniani found in Iceland. Uh, there was also a news story, I believe, just from a couple of years ago that detailed a medieval Chinese coin found in Britain. And what this strongly suggests to me is that there have been instances when you find these coins and currencies and other artifacts that turn up in different locations, there probably were instances where there was trade and there was travel occurring in the ancient world, perhaps not to a great extent, but at very least a greater extent than what is widely recognized historically and archaeologically today. But yet again to me, and I don't want to speak for you guys, but that's not all that controversial an idea. And I guess this is one final point that should be made. If indeed people were circumnavigating parts of the globe, engaging in trade, sailing around, traveling, they would have to have been able to know where they were going, and that's where the maps come into the question. Arguably the most famous map is the Piri Reis map, and it really kind of had its heyday back in the 1950s when Charles Hapgood wrote about it in his book Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. And really, if we're going to do this discussion justice, I mean, we should at very least feature a little of Hapgood's own writing. In the preface to that book, he wrote, This book contains the story of the discovery of the first hard evidence, as he called it at the time, that advanced peoples preceded all the peoples now known to history. And it's right there with that opening line, you can see why this was so controversial at the time it was written. In one field, ancient sea charts, it appears that accurate information has been passed down from people to people. It appears that the charts must have originated with a people unknown that they were passed on perhaps by the Minoans, the sea kings of ancient Crete, and the Phoenicians, who were for a thousand years and more the greatest sailors of the ancient world. We have evidence that they were collected and studied in the great library of Alexandria, and that compilations of them were made by the geographers who worked there. Now, I think it's important, by the way, to note that even though I don't necessarily agree with all of his conclusions, I bought a copy of Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings to read it. I think that often these days people will go on Wikipedia and they'll get the quick synopsis of something like this. They might look at the Piri Reis map, and although it's not a hoax, they might look at it and say, well, it's not what Hapgood thought it was, and therefore I can read two sentences on Wikipedia and I can get the quick synopsis without wasting a bunch of time trying to find out for myself, is this what Hapgood purported it to be? From my own reading of Hapgood's book, I don't agree with all of his conclusions, but again, to understand the process that he went through, to attempt to try he and his students to discern what the information on the map actually entailed and whether it was of an anomalous variety, you learn a lot from reading of that process. But what you have to do is you have to compare and contrast that with more uh, objective, modern analyses that provide a different perspective on things. And that's why often I will go back and I will read what Donnelly wrote about Atlantis, and then I'll look at the modern perspective. I'll read what Hapgood wrote about the Piri Reis map, and then I'll look at the modern perspectives. And to get that modern perspective, we have uh, Gregory C. McIntosh from the University of Georgia Press in his book, The Piri Reis Map. And he gives a few conclusions after, I mean, this book is a deep dive that really looks at this pretty comprehensively. But I want to share just a few of his um, perspectives on the Piri Reis map as summarized later in the book. He says, it has been demonstrated in this book, that is, that the Piri Reis map of 1513 exhibits many features in common with other surviving Portolan charts and extended Portolan-style maps of the 15th and 16th centuries and fits well into the evolution of mapmaking from the late Middle Ages to the early Renaissance. It resembles the contemporary Portuguese maps of Francisco Rodriguez, especially the delineations of the west coast of Africa, the east coast of South America, on the island of San Mateo, as well as the inscription which suggests that the castle at Elmina, or a Portuguese padraio, was depicted on the missing coast of Africa. He goes on to say a Portuguese map was also the apparent source for the land connection between South America and the southern continent. 
similarly shown on the Lopohomem world map and 122 implied on the Rhinel maps. All of these features confirm Piri Reis's statements that he used Portuguese maps as sources for making his world map, although there are features on the Piri Reis map which at first appeared to be unusual, such as the connection of Terra Australis to South America, the orientation of Hispaniola, and the depiction of Cuba as continental. These and other features of the map are not unexpected on a map of the early 16th century. McIntosh also adds that even the distortion and reduction of the east-west breadth of the Caribbean is not unusual. The Arabic Haji Abu al-Hassan chart, contemporary with Piri Reis, severely distorts the coast of Scandinavia and the south coast of Africa so that they will fit onto the vellum of the chart. Similarly, Cuba and the Zorzai maplets is omitted because of insufficient room in the margins of the manuscript. Several place names, and I find this really interesting. He says some of which are easily identifiable apparently have migrated from the feature to which the name was originally applied to an adjacent feature. And Macintosh goes on to give many examples of what he calls nomad place names that appear on the Piri Reis map. He says it also appears that in compiling multiple maps into one, the place names on the source maps were sometimes translated, and in other cases, transliterated. He said this may be due to Piri Reis or the calligrapher not being totally familiar with the languages of the source maps, which include Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and others. We've also seen that Piri Reis offered a very few particularly strange and incorrect guesses as to the origin of some of the place names. But in short, Macintosh disproves what is believed to be the dubious conclusion that the Reyes map embodied Columbus's third voyage map of 1498, showing that it draws instead on the second voyage. He also, that by the way, that second voyage occurred between 1493 and 1496. He also refutes popular misinterpretations that Reyes's depictions of Antarctica are evidence of mysterious ancient ideas like advanced ancient maritime civilizations as proposed by Hapgood and others. So, for my own part, in short, the Piri Reis map is not really as anomalous, I think, as many people have made it out to be, but you still see it featured on a lot of popular programming these days that make a lot more out of ancient mysteries than I think actually exist. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some really unusual ancient maps that have been far more interesting to me, and yet you see very little said about. And I reference a publication uh, that was actually a chapter from a book by Joseph E. Schwartzberg, titled Maps of Greater Tibet, and he refers in this chapter to a number of different Tibetan maps, but one of them is called the Zhangzung map, which is a map that purportedly indicates ancient knowledge of America. And he refers in this chapter to the work of a pair of Russian researchers named Gumilev and Kuznetsov, who, and I'm just going to read a brief excerpt from this chapter, he says, their assumption with which I concur is that the extent of interaction between Tibet and lands to its west, especially Persia, was considerably more extensive in the early historical period than most historians recognize, and that considerable information about distant lands reached Tibetan geographers at either first or second hand, and was incorporated into the original precursor of the Zhangzung map. Again, much like the Piri Reis map, it is a map that takes a lot of data from earlier existing maps and incorporates those into a broader uh, more widespread image of the ancient world. That was quite common with these ancient maps and portal lines. But he says a key to their analysis is their interpretation of what lies at the center of the map, a locale named Bar Pozo Birgad, which they identify as Parsogard, or the Greek Pasargadai, capital of the Persian Empire from 550 to 522 BC under the emperors Cyrus the Great and Cambyses. He says, within that central rectangle, and again, that's the weird thing, if you look at this map, it doesn't look like the Piri Reis map. It doesn't even look really like a map. It's got all these little rectangular features that are arranged in a very strange kind of way. It looks almost more like a, a chart, you know, some sort of a, you know, like a flow chart or something along those lines. But it is a map. It's just the way that it was drawn at that time and in accordance with their culture, etc. So it's a little odd. And he notes that within the central rectangle is a crudely drawn 10-story edifice that it is said represents the tomb of Cyrus although various Greek historians left contradictory accounts of that tomb, uh, Aristobulus said that it had the form of a small tower, and Onechristus, who accompanied Alexander on his Persian campaign, uh, who stated that it was ten stories high. Now, he goes on to say the conclusion is that the map, which obviously postdates Alexander's conquest of most of the area covered, 
therefore also predates the Roman campaigns against Parthia and based on numerous pieces of internal evidence can best be ascribed to the 2nd century BC, which is quite interesting in the context of an ancient Tibetan map that has information about these events and these places. Now, Schwartzberg goes on to say, although Gumilev and Kuznetsov's arguments are informed, carefully reasoned, and in the absence of contrary evidence, and thus making them rather plausible, some are less than convincing, such as the following. And he quotes them talking about one portion of the map that features a transcription of a local place name. And the Russian researchers essentially take this transcription of a local place name featured on the map to be a reference to Madagascar. They wrote, the name Madagascar, which is not used by its residents, was first reported by Marco Polo, and the first description of the island in European geography was given in Periplus of the Erythian Sea, i.e. later than the time of our map and without a name. Consequently, this old Malagasy word must have reached Tibet through India. The Malagasy settled Madagascar about the 3rd century BC from Indonesia, and thus came to the attention of the Indians who were navigating in the Indian Ocean. In other words, the Tibetan cartographer, in addition to Iranian sources, also relied on Indian sources, so that our map is not the product of plagiarism, but an original work reflecting the level of geographic knowledge in Tibet in the 2nd century BC. Now again, Schwartzberg found that argument to be less than convincing, but I also want to look at what the Russian researchers claimed in their analysis. Because they said that they believed, indeed, that there was a land further to the east, a green land. Their interpretation had been that this land was actually America. And that's quite an extraordinary claim to say that a 2nd century Tibetan map knew of America, but nonetheless that was the interpretation of the Russian study. And whether or not that's the case, I think nonetheless that there's a fairly good argument. And even you know the more skeptical Joseph E. Schwartzberg looked at this map and said, Quite clearly, we're seeing evidence of trade and knowledge of lands further to the west than we had expected to see on a map from that area at that time. I guess the big takeaway is that a lot of these anomalous artifacts in archaeology, coins, maps, tablets, and the like, they can be very interesting. They can certainly be suggestive of broader knowledge of geography and cultures from different parts of the world, etc., then we may generally give them credit for being, but they are often also made out to be more anomalous than they really are. And so I'm fascinated with these things because I think that if we're careful in how we look at them, we can actually learn a lot. But it's also probably wise to take the advice of the Romans and to take such accounts uh, cum grano salis, with a proverbial grain of salt. I still think that they're interesting, but often there's a lot more made of these discoveries than there probably actually is. And therefore, here endeth the reading. But before we conclude this segment, I want to ask you guys, what are your favorite artifacts of the potentially anomalous kind? James, let's start with you. Okay, I'll talk about one. I think I've mentioned it on this show before. It's not something that we've covered in depth, but uh, it's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart because it's located in a town in Oklahoma where I went to high school. Uh, it's called the Hebner Runestone. It's a big flat piece of uh, sandstone that's up on its side in this valley uh, kind of on top of a mountain you'd have to see it to kind of get the lay of the geography there but um and it's got these big you know six or seven inch tall rune letters carved into the sandstone and uh there's no real uh consensus on who carved them or, and when they were carved uh they were ori originally attributed to vikings but i've seen some research that says uh, they may be more attributed to uh, de soto's uh, expeditions in the in the uh, south and southwest. Uh, De Soto was definitely in that area. Even some of his uh, his uh, members of his party are known to have been buried in uh, around Fort Smith in Van Buren, Arkansas, and their graves are actually marked there. Yeah, that almost brings us full circle because again, that would be my inclination toward the story we opened with. You know, with the enigmatic mica mines. Again, I guess that begs the question: Would the Spanish have been as interested in the extraction of mica? as the Native American cultures were known to have done. But then again, Jason, I think you've pointed out the idea that they might have seen that as being a valuable commodity for trade. And of course, we still see it used in jewelry and uh, uh, everything from mirrors. It may not be used in mirrors very much today, but at that time, that certainly wasn't impossible. But it actually is useful in microchip technology and all kinds of electronic um, uh, uses as well. So mica is still something that's valuable as a mineral source. It certainly would have been to different people uh, back then, and again, I would look at the Spanish, uh, maybe even De Soto himself, as being a possible connection there. But Jason, one thing is clear: we're going to have to go check out this runestone. We keep hearing about it from James. 
Well, yeah, and you know it's not the only one, but it's it's one that's that's fairly popular uh, for that region. Uh, as far as you know, answering your initial question, something I've found interesting in the last few years um, has been these miscellaneous supposed Chinese artifacts showing up on the East Coast. So you may have heard about this. Uh, some people did a couple years ago. Someone had claimed that they had found about a thirty centimeter long votive Chinese sword in a creek in Georgia. And uh, this was a highly stylized and decorated sword and uh, made of stone, um, but carried a lot of um, inscription on it. And it was it was what's called a votive sword, which is sort of a ceremonial type piece. Um, really couldn't be explained what it was doing there. Now, of course, it was surrounded with great controversy, and we still don't know for sure that it's actually an authentic artifact. But, uh, you know, there is a, a popular theory out there that the Chinese had been exploring on the East Coast in the early 1400s, obviously prior to Columbus's voyage, and that they had made it here considerably earlier. Uh, coins, various uh, small artifacts, nothing of great significance, but uh, this idea is still pretty uh, strong that's floating out there of the Chinese possibly exploring the world in much more detail, much further and much earlier than a lot of people have thought. It's an interesting concept. And again, I wouldn't rule anything out. It's just we, before we can proceed, I think we have to be able to uh, look at the evidence with a very clear and objective mindset and say what is most likely. But again, as we find more and more evidence, I can't help but think that somewhere at the bottom of a stack in some museum, there's another map, there's another treatise, a document, something that's going to give us the missing pieces. And we will yet again broaden our understanding of the ancient past. My final thought as far as interesting artifacts go, I love these maps. I love the discovery of coins and things along those lines, too. Um, but really, in truth, something that I think is less often spoken of that is really fascinating. And I actually want to step over into the realm of pre-Clovis here for a moment. Again, finding definitive pre-Clovis artifacts in deeper strata at the ancient North American sites and South American sites is fascinating. But something that I really love is the discovery of hearths and areas where, even in the absence of artifacts, what appear to be hearths where an actual fire had been built intentionally and radiocarbon dates are able to be extracted from those. That's something that just fascinates me. And there is the implication, although it's been pretty well challenged in archaeological circles, uh, with pertinence to a site called Pendejo Cave, where a handprint found in a piece of clay in association with a hearth suggested a fairly radically uh, earlier appearance of or a human presence at this location uh, in advance of Clovis. Now, keeping in mind that although it's still pretty out there, I think it dates back conservatively to around 30,000 years, although there are some radiocarbon dates from that cave, uh, which suggest 80,000-year uh, occupation. That's really going back, too far back for many in the archaeological community today. But the idea that 30,000 years ago uh, might be on the nearer side of possible would have been ruled out of hand uh, by the 70s, 80s, or 90s, or even the early 2000s. But of course, with the shattering of the Clovis first paradigm, and now that we know that there are numerous archaeological sites that strongly imply a presence earlier than Clovis, and if we look at Monte Verde, as we mentioned earlier, Monte Verde B with the 33,000-year radiocarbon dates from that area, to me it's certainly not impossible and maybe not all that far out to assume that there could have been a human presence here 30,000 years ago, or maybe even older, as suggested by sites we visit like Topper and a few others. So those are my favorites. And even though they don't really deal with the artifacts from the historic period like we've spent more time looking at on this episode of the show, hey, it's good to get away from explicit discussion of ancient archaeology from time to time, delve a little more deeply into things that are more recent, nonetheless enigmatic. But yeah, for my own part, as far as anomalous artifacts go, the hearths and the possibility that humans may have been here much earlier, that's... Nonetheless, fascinating, even if we haven't got enough data to prove it yet. But I remain hopeful as we continue our exploration of the ancient past that we're going to continue to find things that challenge our old thoughts and move us into a new way of thinking about where we come from, who has been here, and more importantly, how long they've been here. But I think that we would be remiss if we didn't touch on one very fun instance from a few decades past uh, that was intended to challenge our idea about archaeology and was, well, proven to be a rather humorous hoax. We will cover that in the final segment with a special guest right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal.
after looking at so many anomalous aspects of archaeology, out-of-place artifacts, and trying to weigh the differences between some of those legitimate discoveries that push the scientific paradigms versus those which are often found in popular literature but have a little less weight behind them. It's always good to have a little fun in conversing about some of the history of hoaxes, too, and that certainly, I think, qualifies for what we know affectionately in these parts as those odd bits of history. Odd bits of history. And joining us this time around as we delve into those odd bits is a friend of the program, a fellow who we met for the first time, all of us together, at the White Pond Excavation earlier this year, uh, Dan Newbanks. He has a background in anthropology, actually holds a degree in anthropology, and also is one of those fellows who I think has a certain fondness for those, well, those odd bits of history like we all do. Dan, it's high <laughs> time we had you join us on the show. How you doing, my man? Good, good. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Really glad to have you here. And, you know, Dan has contributed some stuff behind the scenes. He's sent along scholarly articles to us. You know, he's even gone out there and done some research on our behalf from time to time. And so we really appreciate all the fine folks in the broader network of the Seven Ages Research Associates who help us do what we do here on this program. And Dan, as I understand it today, you've got a real doozy and perhaps a favorite for some of those esotericists out there in the audience. That's right. So have you guys ever heard of the Cardiff Giant? Have you heard the story? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a classic, as a matter of fact. Uh, absolutely. It's a fantastic story. Um, you know, back in the kind of the height of the spiritualism uh, movement back in uh, yeah, so the late 1800s, on October 16th, 1869, as the story goes, this guy, George Hull, uh, who was a landowner and a kind of a prominent atheist in, I think it was upstate New York, um, he hired some guys uh, to dig a well on his property. And lo and behold, after digging, um, you know, he finds this, they, they hit stone and they find this massive giant sculpture or, or it was a... Well, they thought it was a petrified man is what they thought it was. <laughs> and I guess this uh, plays into an argument uh, that Mr. Hull had been having routinely with uh, some local Methodists up there. And it was uh, a, a kind of a back and forth thing after uh, there was an, an argument over, I guess, some, some theological issue about the existence of giants in the early history of the world. And I think that's, uh, that was his motive. But it turns out, of course, this was a hoax that he had planted. And arguably one of the most famous hoaxes in history. But, you know, for anyone who may not be familiar with this story at all, Dan, let's kind of talk a little bit about the, the nitty gritty, the he said, she said, the general overview for those who are new to this subject. Yeah, sure. So um, atheist George Hull, he was arguing with a, a Methodist, uh, I guess it was like a revival meeting preacher, mm -hmm. and they were arguing back and forth about the existence of giants uh, in the early uh, the early history of the world. Of course, according to Christian scriptures, uh, claims that there were giants that lived uh, among us, as it were. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I guess to kind of have a, a little fun with the, the people who were insisting that these things existed, George Hull decided that he was going to pull off this elaborate hoax so it went so far as to ha to have this uh this huge block of stone like a big uh, block of gypsum um quarried out of iowa had the thing shipped by train uh clear to to new york via chicago i guess it was via chicago where there was a guy there by the name of um edward berghart mm -hmm. uh and this guy was uh he was a pretty skilled German stone cutter, I guess. And so he had this thing kind of roughly hewn into the shape of a, a man. And if you look at it, you can actually, uh, you know, Google pictures of the Cardiff giant and, and see that this thing looks like, uh, like a, I don't know, like a sculpture of Frankenstein uh, or something. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, anatomically correct and everything. They take the time to like sculpt this thing into a, a pretty believable, uh, you know, block of, uh, a, a stone man and then he has it uh basically s snuck in overnight um into the town where he lives and they quietly buried it in the guy's backyard by a barn um it, for a year they had it buried in the ground and then uh it, you know a year after that he, he decides you know in 1869 to hire these two guys uh you know, by the by, the name of Gideon Emmons and Henry Nichols, I think were the two guys that that actually uncovered it, and so they start digging this well because they didn't have any idea. Of what, you know, they just thought they were contracted to dig a well, 
Um, they thought it was kind of an odd place to dig a well, but whatever. They're paying, you know, they're paying them to dig, so they start digging. And they, sure enough, hit hit stone and and uh, start uncovering this thing, and it's a huge, huge thing. Media coverage, you know. Oh my gosh, we found evidence of a petrified giant in in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's so great though because this guy, you know, most people. In in the modern era, there's this instant gratification thing. You know, people want it yesterday. They don't just want it now. But Hull seems to be one of those long game kind of guys. I'm going to plant this thing in the <laughs> ground, leave it there for a year, and then just hire a couple of guys to come dig a well on my property so that they find it unbeknownst to them that we've buried a giant <laughs> In a hole in the ground. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine being that motivated to just have some fun with somebody you're arguing with. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I enjoy a good Facebook argument, but I can't imagine going to the kind of trouble <laughs> to to have a 10-foot block of stone, uh, you know, hewn out of the ground and have it shipped by train to my house to bury for a year. You oh, know? my gosh. I know it's it's hilarious. I guess it just depends on who you're arguing with, right? <laughs> some of us true. have had arguments get that out of hand. Yeah. So, well, how did they end up finding out that this thing ultimately was uh, inauthentic, that this was indeed merely a carving and not an actual petrified remnant from the biblical age. Yeah. So, of course, the guy that was involved with this, I guess there was a partner involved, uh, this guy, William Newell, uh, who I think was his cousin, I think was Hull's cousin. The two of them were in on the joke. And um, they basically when it once it was uncovered and they contact the media and say, "Oh my goodness, look what we found!" And <laughs> and so there was a huge uproar. And the next thing you know, Newell William Newell has a tent set up over the giant outside, and he's charging twenty five cents uh, for anybody who wants to see it. So it immediately becomes a bit of a cash cow, and I think he even jacked the price, uh, doubled it to fifty cents at some point. Um, so he starts raking in the money and, and of course the more and more media coverage and word gets around, uh, and then they, they hired a Yale, uh, paleontologist or somebody, maybe they, I don't think they hired him actually. I think he just showed up because of the media coverage. And of course it made him raise an eyebrow, mm-hmm. uh, as any paleontologist would, uh, this guy off Neil Marsh, uh, I believe was his name. And he came out and took a look at the statue kind of, you know, obviously very skeptical, and, uh, you know, it pointed out several things uh, about the, the thing, about, you know, the, what it was made of, for instance, uh, because it's a soluble gypsum. And, of course, if this thing had been buried for, you know, however many thousands of years they, they were claiming, uh, it would not have been in the condition that it was in, right? Right. So, uh, uh, you know, I think Marsh, he, he termed it a, a most decided humbug. <laughs> using the parlance of the era <laughs> yeah, that's right so uh, i guess the the theologians and the the preachers and whatnot that were heralding this as a great triumph for their uh their version of history uh i think that they they were continuing to insist that this thing was real uh despite some experts coming out and uh you know saying otherwise right um, so I guess uh, Hull's in game in the whole thing is he he had an exit strategy and he eventually sold the thing for uh, you know what would be equivalent to about a quarter or about half a million dollars rather. Um, so I mean he he made out pretty well at this hoax. Uh, now see that's an interesting thing because so so here's a guy who perpetrates a hoax but he's trying to fool people as a gag with you know with regard to something an idea that is completely the opposite of his own ideological background. And then after it's all said and done and the hoax is outed, uh, he's able to profit from it. And unlike a lot of hoaxes, which when they're done, they just go away, this one actually didn't go away. Do I understand correctly that the original Cardiff Giant still exists and that there's also a replica someplace, both on display? That's exactly right. Um, I, I, I can't remember offhand where exactly it's um, – it, it's in a museum somewhere. And I'm, let's see, I think it's it maybe in Cooperstown, I think, rings a bell. Isn't that where the Baseball Hall of Fame is? Now, you is would have to ask group? someone else about that, yeah, being the sports aficionado that I am <laughs> or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> James, do you know by chance? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. I'm like, ah. I'm a geologist, not a baseball player. <laughs> baseball. Name. Never heard of her. <laughs> 
So I think there is a, a museum. There's a few different museums in Cooperstown, New York, that are kind of uh, unique. And I think one of them is a, a farmer's museum in Cooperstown, New York. You can still see that uh, Cardiff Giant. Of course, I don't think that anybody knows for sure if it's the the original Cardiff Giant or the copy that was uh, that was done later. Oh, okay. And, the way that the copy came about is an interesting story in and of itself. None other than uh, P.T. Barnum is the one that uh, actually created that uh, that replica. Why did he create it? Was it so that he could have one on display to commemorate the hoax? So after this, uh, after Hull sold his portion, his interest in the uh, in in the giant and its money making. Um, potentials uh he sold it to a syndicate of five guys headed by a guy named david hannam and then they moved it to syracuse new york for exhibition they were making some money off of it in syracuse of course it you know continues to get more and more attention and um pt barnum gets involved because that's what he did i mean that that guy was you know he he was a showman right Mm -hmm. so he he basically made a ton of money off of promoting and propagating various hoaxes. Um, and so this one obviously would catch his, his attention. Uh, he offered $50,000 for the stone giant. Um, and they, they turned him down. They flat out turned him down. Um, and so he kind of covertly, uh, has somebody sneak in and get a, like a wax and plaster, uh, copy of the giant. And then he turns around and, and makes a fake of it. Uh, and he, ended up you know displaying uh another one and, and in fact the the famous um saying that's attributed to pt barnum uh where he says there's a sucker born every minute you know, <laughs> everybody's heard that one but it actually wasn't barnum that said that it was uh apparently david hannum that said it uh you know and it was misattributed to barnum so interesting oh. yeah of- well it absolutely is yeah and uh you know it's just it's an interesting story altogether i want a cardiff giant in my home i don't know the thing's kind of weird <laughs> i think you you hit the nail on the head when you said it was kind of frankensteinian it looked very um i mean it was it was a guy but i mean you know it looks kind of eerie i guess in part by the by virtue of the fact that it's so large i'm kind of glad the thing wasn't an actual petrified man <laughs> <laughs> that's right that would throw throw our uh, history into a little bit of a quandary as such things do <laughs> Those odd bits of history. Dan, I definitely want to thank you so much for jumping on with us, man. This is a, a great story and a wonderful retelling that you've afforded us. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's fantastic to be here as always, and I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah, so once again, we want to thank Dan for coming on the show. That was a great topic. Uh, it was always amazes me with these things is, you know, in the modern day, somebody can just pull up a picture of the Cardiff Giant and, you know, within two seconds, you're like, yeah, that's obviously not real. And you just move on to the next thing. But, you know, at that time period, people would travel for miles and miles and miles because it had that air of mystery and everybody wanted to see it so that they could go home and talk about it. So it's just, you know, it's also a uh, kind of a throwback to how times have changed when when word would travel across the countryside and people would come from counties and states away to see these type of things. So uh, it's something that we're definitely missing in modern day, I would say. Certainly we are. And another facet of this also is the discovery uh, in the late 19th century of uh, the Neanderthal man in Germany. And uh, before we really have a complete understanding of this ancient human cousin, I mean, even up until the last few decades, there had been many anthropologists saying, are we direct descendants from Neanderthal? Did it, was it a clear line of succession? Did Neanderthal man and then humans evolve out of that. I mean, there were all these questions about these kind of things. Now, you go back to the time of the Cardiff Giant and the debate between creationists and those of the scientific mind uh, was all that much greater. And so there was this kind of constant back and forth. And it wasn't just with regard to that. I mean, there were the arguments about uh, migrations into North America. And this is something that still, of course, is debated today. But because of the contentious attitudes and the differing opinions and ideas at that time, hoaxes became prevalent for a number of reasons. Many people were doing it, of course, just to get a laugh, to get a rise out of people. Others did it sort of to muddy the waters, but some actually went so far as to plant hoaxes in various uh, locations for the purpose of trying to steer the narrative in their favor. And that's kind of a weird self-contradictory way of going about things, because if you really believe something, it's funny that people would go to the lengths of fabricating evidence in support of what they believe. It just goes to show that human belief itself is a very 
confusing and sordid subject in itself. One of those many odd bits of history that we like to touch on here on this program from time to time. Gentlemen, I think it's just about time, by the way, for us to pony up on more time right here at the Crosstime Pub Bar. Pour another Guinness before we head on back down the road. What do you say? I say yep. cheers. I agree. And you know, it might be time for one of those pumpkin beers. Oh, yeah, those things. I mean, everybody else is doing their pumpkin spice lattes. We'll stick with the pumpkin brews. How's that? Well, on behalf of Mr. James Waldo, geologist recently relocated back out to Arkansas, Jason Penn Trail, a little further south of me, and up here in the high country of the Appalachias, Micah Hanks. We are the Seven Ages Research Associates. Always glad to spend some time with you guys out there, and we'll catch you again next time here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. 